Matt, the floor is yours. Please give us some info that I can yell, oh my God, and blow our minds, brother. So uh, okay. what do you got for us? I think that we're going to accomplish that today. I'm, I'm pretty excited because I'm going to present um, some brand new information that I've never covered. This is, I guess you could call this the precipice of the edge of what I'm currently researching right now to expand on, to potentially do some writing, maybe a new book. This is, a, this is an area that I think has some attention, but not nearly enough attention. And I guess you could call, you really could call it um, the next frontier for our, our earth in terms of exploring places that haven't really been explored. And as you can see, um, I'm sharing on the screen, today we're gonna to be focusing on, instead of above ground, we're gonna go underwater. And we're going to really cover some extensive um, new discoveries and some really exciting evidence that's come out that really paints this, a far different picture of our world from the standpoint of all of these lost um, aspects of our ancient history that are really sunken beneath the ocean. For those who are familiar with my work, um, I cover a lot of above ground typically. I do a lot of ancient translations, ancient texts. I do a lot of megalithic lost civilization studying, looking at the idea that certain civilizations and cultures are in fact far older than we're told. And there, there have been different epics of um, human history that have gone on. And it's not really just this linear look at, we say, okay, you know, in our Rockefeller history books, you know, we're taught in school when you're reading, and I say, I talk about this all the time, but we're, you know, we're told, and if you went on the street and asked the average person that, oh yeah, it wasn't, you know, I, I think I remember reading about how human civilization emerged from Sumer roughly 6,000 years ago. And that's where this whole story started. And before that, it was just all hunter gatherers and, you know, a very primitive sort of non-sophisticated view. And that's where we build our entire identity of the human race on, is that type of window of looking at our story. But what if our story is far different than what we're told? And in fact, not only is it more than double the age of what we're, what we're told in our history books, but far older than even that. And more importantly, as we start get, to get into this, you'll see that it opens up doors and avenues into really looking at things like human consciousness and energetic um, sentient awareness of human beings and their place in the universe and in our place here on earth and in really separating us from the animal kingdom and looking at, and at us from a more holistic standpoint and saying, well, you know, what are our origins? Where, how long, long ago did civilization emerge? And, you know, what is our story? And so today, instead of covering, as I said, these megalithic civilizations scattered all around the world from, say, Gobekli Tepe and um, Ahu Vinapu in Easter Island, matching thousands of miles away in Peru, the same building architecture style, um, which we're, not, we're told was impossible, all the way, you know, looking at things like the Great Pyramids of Giza and the designs we see in the Osirion in Obidos, Egypt, and Karnak, all the way across um, the world to places like um, Elephanta Island in Aswan, Egypt, and Persepolis and Nash Nashi Rostam in Iran, and Kinnis Rock in Iraq, and right through Turkey and India and even Japan, we see this, this aspect of our history, these cultural sites spread across the world that we know from looking at some of the new evidence that's coming out are far older than what we've been told, far older. Some extend even beyond the last ice age, which was 12,000 years ago. And that's really where this story begins. And I just wanted to lay out that foundation before we start to go the other way and, and go underwater to explain how some of these structures and some of these underwater sunken cities could exist. It's really like a giant umbrella where certain key individuals throughout history, you can go all the way back to the Roman Empire, have had this need to want to control the story control the message of who we are and how far back we go and really what defines this human experience. And unfortunately, these ancient sites and a lot of these incredible discoveries have been covered up and hidden because it would disrupt this delicate paradigm that we're taught. And so today, we're going to be exposing some really incredible things that by the end, I think some people are going to almost be angry that some of these things are remaining at the bottom of the ocean not being um, uncovered because I think that's our duty here as sentient beings to explore our world and to try to explore our past to try to understand everything better. 
And the first place I want to start is when we look at these ancient sites above ground, first of all, I mentioned Gobekli Tepe and a lot of the other sites around the world. When we look at the tools that were necessary to build those structures and the sophistication that is shown in those structures themselves, as long, along, as, along with the ancient texts that we find in places like um, ancient Mesopotamia with cuneiform tablets and ancient Hindu texts like the Bhagavad Gita and right, up, right through ancient Gnostic texts, things like the Book of Enoch, Nagamani scriptures, and countless others. What we find is this story that goes much, much further back than we're told. And the first thing I want to point out is that when we actually, they do radiocarbon dating of things like Gobekli Tepe in Turkey, this ancient astronomical temple site, they go into this, this, these big stone um, pillars and they, they find organic matter hidden be, in between the cracks and they try to get an accurate date based on carbon dating of how old it was. And what they've found is, and, I, and this is something I mentioned many times, but it's, it gives us like this building block, this framework to, to then build off of. They find that Gobekli Tepe is somewhere between 11 and 12,000 years old. And, but that's only the organic matter that's found within that. You can't actually age stone. So even sites like that could be much older than that. But at least it gives us a ballpark to say, okay, so then these ancient sites that have very similar sophistication and building styles, they're all built before 11 or 12,000 years ago. And that's the consensus I want to lay down as we start these discussions again and get deeper. So what was the world like 10 to 12,000 years ago or before? And that's where the key to this whole thing starts. Now, for those who aren't aware, our planet, we think that we've conquered our, our Earth. You know, this little blue speck in the middle of a vast cosmic um, universe we think that we've conquered it and we can, we can just trash and destroy this world and it doesn't matter because we've conquered it. Well, it's very interesting. I'll give a couple little stats to show that we really haven't actually seen that much of our planet. And that may be a little surprising to a lot. But for those who don't know, our Earth is mostly covered by water. Oceans cover about 70% of our planet. And of those oceans that make up most of our planet, only roughly 5% 5% of the entire ocean has been explored. That means that if, if our oceans unbelievable. If, if our oceans cover 70%, it means that most of our planet is unexplored, yeah. which is totally wild, right? When we think that we can paint together this story of our past, whereas we haven't even explored it. You know, in that, and of course, the question that's going to keep coming up over and over again as we go along is whether or not that's deliberate. You know, do they not want to explore the ocean? Yeah, they yeah, know yeah, there's yeah. all kinds of things down there that would really disrupt this paradigm, this paradigm of reality and history that we're taught. Now, as we, as we go into this and we start looking at these ancient sites around the world and then we start to go closer off the coast, we say, well, hmm. So if, if ancient civilizations above ground are much more sophisticated than we're told, then what about what we find underwater? Yeah. You know, could some of those, those civilizations be even older than those on land? And that's what we're going to get into as we start looking at some data. Now, here is a snapshot of the way that our Earth looked at 12,000 years ago. This is a recreation based on using ice core samples from Greenland, where they're able to take a snapshot and say, okay, so we can look at where the relatively where these ice sheets had been located. And this is the last ice age on our planet. And, you know, if for those who, who look, watch cartoons growing up as kids and go to museums and see cavemen with big sticks hunting woolly mammoths, that's what we're taught, right? During the last ice age, it was just hunter-gatherers on the earth, and they were running around chasing Siberian tigers and woolly mammoths, and that's it. That's the whole story we're told. But what if it's not that way at all? What if, in fact there was sophisticated civilizations that existed around the world at the same time as hunter gatherers. That's the, the, the crucial piece in here to understand. And as I mentioned, go back to Tepe a second ago, that site, when they were excavating it, going down through the layers, they found, yeah, they found tools from hunter gatherers, but then right next to it, right next to it in the, in the same layer or right above it, all of a sudden agriculture just comes out of nowhere. So you can clearly see that there's these moving pieces around the world where there are more sophisticated civilizations that are existing just at the same time 
of less sophisticated. I mean, is that that hard to really wrap your head around? The same thing is happening today. Look at how advanced our civilization has become. You know, we're leaving Earth, traveling to places beyond here. We have incredible sophistication with artificial reality, creating AI and all these amazing things. But at the same time, there are civilizations in the Amazon rainforest and remote islands that have no technology at all, and they live like in another time. That's the type of aspect I want us to really wrap our heads around. But the most important thing of that aspect to understand is that, okay, so if these civilizations are pre-existing with this, the last ice age, look at where the ice age extended. I'm up here in Maine where I'm talking about right now. I was under one to two miles of ice where I'm speaking right now. That's why we don't find sophisticated building structures in a lot of the United States. That's the reason is because there was a giant block of ice sitting right across about half the whole country. And so therefore, a lot of the more sophisticated civilizations that we find are further south. But the reason why this is important to, to show is that during this time period of, of Earth, the same amount of water has been present on Earth as it was thousands and thousands of years ago, which means if you have these ice sheets that are miles deep covering the entire northern and southern hemisphere, it means that a lot of that water that's on the Earth is locked up in ice. And because of that, ocean levels pre-11 or 12,000 years ago were 400 feet lower than they are today. Now, for some comparisons, Sam lives, near, Sam lives near LA, you know, places like LA, um, Chicago, yeah. New York City, 400 feet is roughly the equivalent of about half the size of most of the, of the skyscrapers that we see in a lot of our cities. It's a pretty big number. 400 yeah. feet is, is significant. Look at, look at today, places in Florida, where they're building on the coast and they're worried about sea level rise of like 20 or 30 feet. And, and then just imagine a 400 foot ocean change. So if you're a civilization and you built along the coast, which most civilizations did, it means that it's entirely possible that the majority, and I want to say that again, the majority of all ancient civilizations that built may be underwater still today. Um, I don't know if you saw, Sam, but a couple days ago, a big discovery was made off of the Yucatan Peninsula. It made a lot of news headlines around the country where we're told that the people of the Americas, specifically Yucatan, Mexico, that they were told that they came across the Bering Sea Strait and during the last ice age and migrated down and then they lived in cultures for the last several thousand years. But what we're finding is completely contradicting that. This is further proof to show that our timeline and the how far back things go is much older. Uh, about a week ago, the discovery that was made off of the Yucatan Peninsula, off of Mexico, they found caves and underwater mining that had been done by the, the ancient Maya that was, that was being dated right now. And this isn't like conspiracy dating. This is the mainstream dating. They're saying, I don't know what to tell you. The only thing that's possible is that this is 10 this is 11 to 12,000 years old, but that doesn't make sense with what our history books tell us. So slowly this paradigm is eroding around the edges and we're going to totally erode that by the end of this conversation. So what they found was that in, in some of these sites off of the Yucatan, they found some cave systems that were dug out that were over a thousand feet long and they found over 350 mining sites off of the Yucatan. Now think about if you were a hunter gatherer, civilization like we're told they were until they started to slowly build if you had a civilization that was primitive there would be no need to do mining mining is something that happens as a civilization becomes more sophisticated where they need to start developing tools and they start to do elaborate artwork and a lot of other things that are indicative of a more advanced culture so what was what they were mining was this type of element called ochre which is a heavy iron rich um, element. And what was neat about ochre, um, which is what they were trying to find off the coast is that they can use it for not only artwork for painting and murals, but they, you can use it as um, skin protection from the sun and even has medical properties. So th these, these Mayan people right off of the Yucatan, and that's gonna be a big focus of our discussions today, they were mining 11 to 12,000 years ago, which completely goes against what we're taught. Now. Moving, moving along here, 
But Matt, before you go on there, so you're saying that maybe the Aztec pyramids were already around during the Ice Age? Yeah, one of the one of yeah the the thing that I'm going to point out here as we go along is looking at cultures like down in Peru with the pre Inca, the Aztec, the Maya, right up through um, the Anasazi of the Southwest United States, and right down to the Toltec and Olmec. These cultures look like there was different epics even within their culture. So, like if you think of the Maya, they were probably inheriting inheriting and building on top of much older structures from their ancestors just like the Inca. So the Inca talk about how their ancestors were called the Tiki Viracocians, not the Inca. They're a later culture. And that's what I want uh, uh, our, us to wrap our minds around is that there are these subsequent epics that happened where some cultures might've gotten wiped out, but some survived, jump started again, created the culture again, and then maybe they were almost destroyed again. And then c- continues, continuously goes on. We don't know how many of these occurred. We don't know how many times human civilization has risen, ro- risen up and then been knocked back down again to have to go back up again. So now, what you're telling me, Matt, is that there have been some years, 2020 in the past, where everything goes foobar and then something <laughs> hits that button. Because it seems like that's where we're going right now. Everything's like just going to a head of like reset. You know, it's kind of like also what you're talking about where people kind of just take over something that was already there. Yeah, and that's the biggest problem is with places like Egypt, which is probably the greatest of our on-land um, conspiracies that we, that we have out there. Because we, we look at ancient sites like the Temple of Karnap, Karnak, and we see hieroglyphics and all this writing on it, and we immediately assume that those cultures that did that built those structures. Why is it so hard for us to wrap our heads around the idea that those cultures came along later, found them, and then put their hieroglyphics on it and to try to claim it? It's like what you said. If you have a city that's been abandoned or something, and then people come in and put graffiti all over it, and they're like, oh, look, those people that put graffiti all over the walls, they must have built this. No, they just came through later, and they tried to take credit for those places. That's what we're really looking at here. And what I have on the screen is a snapshot of – the ice core data that's been taken out of Greenland to show us what our climate was like during this time period of when the ice caps rapidly melted. When I showed this image a minute ago, what we're taught in school is that the ice age slowly melted and receded. You know, the, um, it just receded north over time. And then as, as we go along over, over hundreds to thousands of years, the ice eventually melted. But that's not what the climate data is showing. Instead of that, it's looking more like the ice caps just liquidated and just melted instantly along with all of these very, very violent earth changes that went on. And you can see that in this graph. Look at the spike right after 15,000 years ago towards 11,600. Look at those fluctuations compared to today where we are over the last several thousand years. It's almost like all of these um, changes with the climate, all us all freaking out here, is like this minor blip compared to what happened in the past. And this is important because this gives us evidence, tangible evidence. Unbelievable. Well, it shows us that, look at the way the earth fluctuated. That's how we can explain that these ice caps not only melted extremely fast, but it went from really warm to really, really cold to extremely warm again in only a multi-thousand year period. And during that period, Sam, those cultures went up and up and up and down, up and down, up and down, and then they were wiped out. And what happened after the Younger Dryas, this is called, during the, place, the, the Holocene, moving out of the Pleistocene, is we had a period where human civilizations after that period were more and more primitive, not more and more advanced. We've gone backwards. We have, literally have amnesia of all of, of everything that came before us. And we, we have this perception that, We've gotten here based on our own accumulated um, knowledge of only the last 6,000 years. But really, I think a lot of this knowledge was found and we've tried to build off and try to explain what happened before us. Now, for those who remember, Sam, you might remember and everyone else who's on this might remember in 2004, there was a massive tsunami that occurred off of India in Sumatra. And during that Mm -hmm. tsunami, before a major tsunami occurs, you always get a massive earthquake. Usually a fault will drop and then have this massive amount of energy get 
thrown into the oceans. Well, what happens before a tsunami and the reason why you know to warn is you'll be down at the ocean and all of a sudden the oceans will just recede. They'll go way right. out to sea. And they'll yeah, go yeah, yeah, yeah. And all the animals will freak out and the elephants will start running inland. And everyone's like, you know, what's going on? They know because they've seen this time and time again where these earth changes create massive tidal waves, tsunamis on our planet. And I think that that's something we should consider with some of the events that happened before. Anyway, so in 2000... Hey, wait, wait, Matt, Matt, quick question about the, the, the weather changes. Could that be uh, earth, earth causes or some civilization, some DWs, how, we're, how we fuck around with the weather now? Or is that, is that possible that the, that the earth could fluctuate that much? While I'm completely under, um, I'm completely supportive of the fact that we are severely polluting our planet and destroying it with fossil fuels and trash. I am hesitant based on under, looking at things like this graph to blame all of these climate changes on human activity. Boom, there you go. I think that we are more like, um, like, you know, poking a bee nest that is already angry and f infuriated because it's going through these changes that seem to be related to two different things. Seems to be related to grand solar maximums and minimum changes with the sun, and also yeah. changes that are, un that are undergoing within our solar system and in our, in our galaxy. Seems like there's this um, combination of events that, that seems to go on between every, t every 12 and every 10 to 20,000 years, call it. And that's why, when I mentioned sites like Gobekli Tepe, what was the purpose of that site? It was an astronomical site to, to map the heavens. What they were doing was every T-shaped stone, stone pillar was representing looking at these, these different zodiacal changes as part of what's called the precession of the equinoxes. And that's a, that's a 26,000 year cycle. What does that mean? It means that they knew that, that the cycles that the earth goes, goes through, a lot of them go through disasters. And so they had to map. It's like mapping both disasters and energetic changes with things like human consciousness taking leaps. That's why Kukulkan's temple in the Mayan site of Chichen Itza, every step of that temple with this, the serpent, um, basically the serpent yep. that's wound down, you guys have seen before, every step of that represents higher levels of human consciousness because the Maya realized that human consciousness, rather than being totally random, these leaps that, that happen, happen with these cycles. So ancient cultures became obsessed with tracking the, the zodiac processional ages because they knew that they could map and understand the future. And so getting back to what I was talking about, in 2004, we had this massive tsunami that, that happened, one of the biggest in our, in our lifetimes, right? And right before that tsunami rushed inland and destroyed and killed, over 200,000 people in that event, okay, died. But oh before God. that happened, the oceans massively receded and the India National Guard and a lot of other groups were flying helicopters and planes to come and, and, and go inland to try to help people and survey what was going on. And what they found was absolutely astounding. When they were flying over India, they, just, they saw under the water as it was receding, all kinds of civilizations and structures underneath oh, the water that, were, that, had been, wow. that had been submerged previously, but because the oceans had receded, they got this little glimpse of them, right? And then as the tsunami came in, ocean levels went back to normal and they were gone again. But is that so hard to understand? Let me give you a little bit of a background. In India, is, we've found some of the oldest ancient sites in the world. And you can actually find cuneiform tablets, one called Enki in the World Order, where this region called Maluha is mentioned as trading at the same time with the ancient Sumerians far back in our history. And the, the area of Maluha that I mentioned is India. It's, it's the area of India. And in India, we find places like Alora Caves and Barabara Hill Caves and Kanhari Caves, where you have these massive basalt cliffs that have doorways and temples carved right out of them. In fact, in Ellora Caves, Kalesh Temple is the largest singly built stone structure on the earth. It's like a giant mountain that they literally carved a temple out of the mountain and it's sitting there. But what's the problem with that is that during that time period that we're taught in our, in our history books, those civilizations were supposed to only have Bronze Age tools. 
And those rocks, those basalt granitic rocks are too hard to be able to carve with those tools, which means that it would have been impossible to be able to build that sophistication in the timetable we're taught, meaning that those, those areas in India and many other areas I mentioned are pre-Ice Age. They're part of these, what I call the lost civilizations of our planet. Now, that's, that's just that one area off of India. Now, I'm going to share this image right here, um, Sam. This is an area off of um, Yanaguni Monument off of Japan. And it's deep underwater. And I, I think you would probably agree, if you look at something like that, look at how sharp those edges are. It looks like someone created like a corridor with stairs at the back where they're walking yep. into a yep. temple. This site, the Yanaguni Monument, has extensive ruins underwater, just like we're told. But geologists, mainstream geologists come along and they say, this, these are just natural formations and they're nothing that has to do with human civilization. <laughs> so, what, so what we're finding is, and this is, this is the, the key for, you know, if anyone's watching this or the way that we should think, wrap our minds around, if on land, we find evidence of megalithic advanced building. That means that we need to immediately go underwater and go look because we'll probably find even older potential structures under the oceans. Now, the hey first, Matt, hey, yeah. I'm sorry, real quick, just to break in. Is there in in mainstream uh, in the mainstream field, uh, whether in academia or in the or actually in practice, guys who are out in the field, um, is is there are there any leading experts who are uh, uh, saying what you're saying that that civilization is much older than we know and and how are they being treated if if, if they are that's actually good, that, that's a great point johnny what we great have job is, johnny what we have okay. is is like an archaeological doctrine club that exists with mainstream now if you spend your entire life getting accredited and you go to school and you want to become an archaeologist or a historian and you want to be taken credible Credibly, if you try to discuss a lot of these structures being older, you could have your entire career ruined in being ridiculed. And that's what's happened. So the only individuals that I would say are semi-mainstream are, and this, is, this isn't any kind of a, um, a negative connotation for them. It's just a lot of people that haven't heard of them is individuals like Graham Hancock and Raynal Carlson, um, Robert Schock, Robert Preval have come out and they're not only talking about ancient Egyptian pyramids, but they're just talking about in general that a lot of these civilizations and the structures show signs and like, for instance, weathering along the Sphinx enclosure. It just doesn't make any sense that they were the age that we're being told. They were much older. They had different purposes than we're told and they're much more extensive. And so that's why we just need to open our mind to the fact that civilizations are much more sophisticated and older. And we have these epics that have been separated on the screen. I'm showing what is an ancient Egyptian site that was found off of the city of Alexandria, off of Egypt, underneath the ocean. You find temples and small, small um, temples and monuments and these structures and murals from when these ancient Egyptians had built in these, in these, these areas. And it means that it's so amazing to me that this, this is being ignored. If you have structures underwater, that are sophisticated like this. It means that they're built before the last ice age because ocean levels weren't at that point where you could build there until you go back 11, 12,000 years ago. It's simple as that. It, these, what you're seeing on the screen is 100% without a doubt built before 11 or 12,000 years ago. And yet they're like, uh, uh, we'll just, you know, not really talk about that. And then pe maybe people won't really pick up on it, but but we are picking up on it and we're talking about it and we're trying to expose the fact that these ancient sites around the world are so much older and more advanced than we're talking than, than we're told. Now, this is where it gets exciting. Everything that I've now just shared with you guys is just building up to what we're about to get to. Okay. Yes. Now, this is where we get into some really new stuff. In the news, it was talked about recently, they were talking about fishing regulations or whatever it was. And I, and I was just, you know, being a curious person. I had never heard of the Northeast Canyons and Seamounts Marine National Monument. And so I was like, just curious. I went to look at it because that's what I do. And when I, went, when I went to look at it off of um, Google terrain map, I, I was completely blown because I'm coming from this with a perspective I, 
of looking at this saying, okay, so I know North America has had disasters because of the last ice age, huge, massive outflows. Randall Carlson and Graham Hancock talk about how in the Pacific Northwest, right below where the ice sheets were, there was outflows that were so dynamic after the ice rapidly melted that they found giant gorges. I mean, giant gorges like Columbian Gorge that were made much wow. deeper and much more extensive. But also in places like Montana, they're finding these huge open plain areas with these rolling, what seem like rolling hills for miles, but they're not hills. They're like these um, types of terrain for what look like waves and water washed over them, giant rivers where we see these, these um, natural humps. Like give you an example, if you in LA, right, you guys are pretty dry. You go outside, you just had a big storm, big downpour. And you go over along some sandy um, side of the road and you see like what's called rill erosion where water from the, from the torrential downpours have washed down along and they created like these river channels through the sand. But the water dried up since, since that happened. So all you're left with is the area where the water had previously been. And it's so obvious, right? You see where all the sediment is disturbed and it's got this type of motion where it's, it moves up and down where it's indicative of some massive outflow of water. Now that's in the Pacific Northwest. And you can see that, and I've done other shows in the past where you can see evidence of that. And I encourage everyone to look into that. But so what about massive outflows in other places? You know, is it just up there? Or is there evidence in other locations that completely open this perspective? Now on the screen, I came to this just totally randomly, just curious and looking into, into stats until I started to look into some of the information about this. Gilbert Canyon, right in the center of this um, Northeast Canyons and Seamounts is deeper than the Grand Canyon. And I want to just pause here and have you wrap your mind around that for a minute, okay? What? We're not talking about canyons that are just impressive underwater canyons, deeper than any canyons on the surface of our earth deeper okay so how do you create a how do you create a massive canyon there's only one way massive outflows of water that create erosion over time some of them can happen during longer periods of time and some can happen in shorter periods of time like when i talked about in the pacific northwest now look at the little mini map that i create i showed on the screenshot here do you see how the colors change where it's got a very light white color off of the mm -hmm. off the coast of the of new england right yeah. there, new york city that represents what's known as the continental yeah. shelf, okay? The continental shelf. And what that means is that at one time, this was, this was, this is a very shallow sea. It used to be land that was above the ground, okay? Yeah. And so I got curious. I'm like, okay, so if ocean levels were 400 feet lower 12,000 years ago, what's the maximum depth on the continental shelf? So I pulled up oceanography maps and I did a little digging. The average ocean depth in this entire continental shelf hundreds of miles off the coast is less than 300 feet. It's between 100 and 300 feet deep. Why is that important? Because ocean levels were 400 feet lower, meaning that these areas would have been largely exposed during this time period. So if you have a massive outflow where the, where the ice caps melt and create these giant outflows of water like we see in the Pacific Northwest, that's how I... I hypothesize that that may be why you get these canyons all along the very edge of the continental shelf. And what I mean by edge is, and I mean an unbelievable edge. If you look at the bottom of oceanographic canyon Gilbert and Lydonia, ocean depths go from one to 300 feet to thousands of feet right off right away. Meaning that Boom, if water was rushing across the, the surface of that, it would have gone off like almost like a cliff into the ocean. And that's how it could have created these giant canyons off of the ocean. And so I'm starting to wrap my head around this. I'm like, is this evidence of these incredible disasters that led to the disappearance of a lot of these ancient civilizations? And we're going to get into um, some of those as we, as we get going here. Now, this is... Wow. This is going to be pretty exciting for people who maybe not, don't know about some of this information. Um, off of the Bahamas, so off of Southeast Florida, this area of Bahamas, you know, it's a nice tropical place. People go down there for vacation. Oh, it's great, right? Down there, the ocean is so clear 
because of the way that the tropical water is that you can see way down in, you can see the bottom of the sand on the, bottom, uh, on the ocean floor. And so when I was researching this area off the Bahamas called the Bimini Road, for people who don't know what the Bimini Road is, um, there was a discovery made off of, oh, hold on a second here. here. This is my microphone. There was a discovery made off of the Bahamas called the Bimini Road. And what, what that was, they found a half a mile long road of these giant square stones that were per evenly spaced for a half a mile. Just, you know, a half a mile underwater, this, this ancient road. And that, that ancient road, is, it's the same type of principle as off of Japan, where they're saying modern day experts and geologists are saying, well, it's just a coincidence of, you know, the creation of these structures underwater by natural forces. There's nothing there that's interesting to note. And yet divers are looking at these structures, these stone slabs underwater, perfectly following this ancient road. And they're saying, how could something like this be created naturally? So I started to scratch my head and I started to do a little research on it. And while I was researching it, I was given a tip by another researcher who said, go look at these coordinates. And they, they had given me this message. And I went and I looked at them. And right off of Nassau, Bahamas, um, a little ways off of the coast, on Google imagery, if you zoomed in, you could see underwater because of the way that how clear the water was, you could see these underwater structures off of NASA in the same area as the Bimini Road. And I remember I created posts about them and I was sharing, and this is a couple of years ago, I was sharing and it was a really exciting discovery to see clear as day, this ocean floor that's totally flat with sand with nothing else around it. And then these pointy like structures and these um, squared off structures that just look completely artificial out of nowhere. And then what happened? Six months went by or something. I went back to look at it again. Gone. Poof. Just like that. The images, what? Showed, the image, the images were blurred out or they showed nothing but just what looked like generic ocean, like what was around it. It was gone. It was like you know, that area had, oops, you know, we didn't mean to show that. And then, the, and then they covered it back up and, you know, that might seem silly to say, wow. but um, that was, it was something that was so significant. I had, I, I had created images of it and I was like, I was sharing it. You could see it clear as day. Now here's now some more evidence to prove that point of, about that being real. And this is where we get to the heart of the biggest discovery of all. And now I'm going to just build this up, Sam, to say that I believe that this may be the greatest discovery in terms of re redefining the entire, entire paradigm that we've, that we've made in human history. Now, having said that, places, ancient cities like Eridu that are mentioned as the first city ever created and a lot of these other structures around the world are incredibly important, but they get muddled with the timeline and other individuals will come along and say, no, no, they weren't really built by, by so-and-so. You can't really prove it. Right. But this site, you can't explain. It's like, if this was to come out, it would completely redefine the entire story. Now, let me get into what happened. Now, keep in mind, this is in the same area as the Bimini road and this Nassau Bahama area that we had seen underwater air, um, underwater structures in 2001. Um, there was a, a Canadian marine surveying company, okay? Not a conspiracy group looking for anything underwater. A, can a Canadian uh, marine surveying company, high-end company that does work for, for groups around the world. And they were hired by the Cuban government to come off of Cuba and survey around the coast because there have been numerous shipwrecks through throughout history that are they're laying on the ocean bottom and, and Cuba was really interested in going in and finding some of those in some of those shipwrecks and so they hired this Canadian company um, and the, the the two individuals are named um, Pauline um, Selinsky and Paul Weinswick okay so this couple that owns this company they're hired by the Cuban government in 2001 they come out they come down here we're using all their high-end technology sonar and they're surveying off of the coast of Cuba. Now, just to give a little bit of information out ahead of that before I get into what they found, in 1966, the Cuban government was, on, was doing some archeological digs in the Western Cuba in the same area called Pinar del Rio. 
and they found megalithic structures right along the coast of Cuba, okay? And that was in 1966, but no one ever heard about anything since then. They just disappeared in the wind, okay? So 2001 comes, and they're doing just this research, this oceanography research off the coast, and they're diving down into these unbelievable depths. You know, we mentioned how deep something like 400 feet was, but these depths that they were going to survey with sonar are over 2,000 feet deep. Wow. So they're down there and they're not expecting to find anything except maybe shipwrecks. So they're surveying, they're surveying, and they come across this giant plateau that's totally flat. And over this area of a two kilometer area, they come across this incredibly bizarre place where they find these giant symmetrical structures under, deep underwater on the bottom of the ocean that have characteristics of pyramid structures and straight angles on these buildings and things like even circular structures all in the same place. But all around it, instead of being, okay, fine, are those just natural rocks? It's all just sand around it. There's no structures anywhere else around it or even rocks to say, okay, well, that could be rocks. On this flat, sandy area is out of nowhere are all these structures. Now, they didn't want to jump on that conclusion right away because they're, they're academics and they're, they're, you know, they're, they want to be taken credibly. So what they did was they were really objective about it. And they said, okay, we're not going to say that they're man-made, but we're going to investigate it further. And so what they did was they went to a, a geologist named Manuel Toralde, who was the head of Cuba's National Histor uh, History Museum. He's a geologist. And they said, they said, Manuel, we want to get a second opinion on these. You're an expert geologist. Can you come and look at some of the stuff that we've found and maybe look at it and get a second opinion? So Manuel says, okay, I'd love to be part of the team. And they take and they go down and they take these sonar images of this, these structures and they recreate, based on those sonar images, what these structures look like. And when they did that, they were blown away. They, Whoa. and this, this is an Whoa. accurate, I, this is 100% accurate. This came from um, Pauline and Paul themselves out of this Canadian mining company, which by the way, was called Advanced Digital Communications. And they released this, this rendering of taking the sonar and then they mapped out, you know, like if you've seen a little craft going across and they're, they're shining light and they're mapping out this area, that's what they did. And they map out this giant area on the sea floor and it is undeniable. This, this For those that are listening, Matt, how would you, just listening through the audio, I what you're seeing right here. Okay, so what we're seeing are, is undeniable proof, in my opinion, of um, artificially created structures that look like a cross between an ancient Egyptian pyramid and, and like a, a Mayan pyramid, like something out of Guatemala, like Tikal or uh, Palenque. Um, cause it has like, steps like, cause you can see like the steps st in it. Yeah. Like a, like a step pyramid. Um, it looks like basically that three, three, uh, three pyramids. The one in the middle is the biggest pyramid. And then you have, uh, I don't know how to describe the side here, but it almost looks like, um, you know, I'm going to be honest with you. I thought when I, when I, I looked at, it, I go, Oh, that looks like Wimbledon almost in a weird way where it's like two different, like what looks like. I'm, they're obviously not tennis courts, but it looks like two different buildings with no roof on top of them. And then on the side, the far, far, far side, it looks like what something could almost be either another pyramid or like a castle type thing. Yes. And Matt, you, you, you think the things on the right hand side is where the, uh, like where they used to play sports, you know, the Aztec sport where they used to play like a kind of like a stadium. Yeah, it really does. That's a good point. It really, when you go to Mayan and Aztec sites, um, Teotihuacan, or you go to places like Chichen Itza, you see these giant walled-in enclosures where they had ceremonies and big games and these events where all the people would gather. But in front of it, they would always have these giant pyramid structures, temples facing them, like as all facing a certain direction. Now, I want to just, I want to back up a little bit. So Manuel he sees these sonar images and he's completely blown away. He says, let's investigate further. And so the team comes back 
and they take a remotely operated underwater vehicle, this giant vehicle. Oh my God. Remember, we're talking about 2,100 feet underwater. Human beings can't dive down that far. You would die. And so therefore, how do we get down there, right? It's, it's down the bottom of the ocean. So they sent down this remote vehicle and they get, they get right down into these structures and they only get down to the perimeter of it. Because what happens is as they get closer to it, they suffered a massive technological problem and they had to bring it back up. Something terrible happened to, to the technology on that remotely operated vehicle. But before that happened, they were able to get images and video of some of these structures. And what they found was that some of the stone blocks of these pyramids were eight to 10 feet long single blocks like just like in something like ancient pyramid of giza multi-ton blocks granite blocks with perfect curved edges uh, built up in in such a sophisticated way that it would it would rival anything we see in giza today now so they're down there and they're looking at this and they're and the only conclusion they can come to is that this has to be some kind of a, a, an, an artificially created structure. And I have a quote from Manuel. He studies this. He studies it, and, he, and this is the quote that Manuel gives. He says, these are extremely peculiar structures, and they have captured our imagination. But if I had to explain this geologically, I would have a hard time. So Man, Manuel gives that statement, okay? And this story actually... Has, has a mini explosion briefly in 2001. This comes out and everyone's like, is this Atlantis? Is this Atlantis? You know, all these things. And then we have um, this specialist in underwater archaeology from Florida State University. You know, he, he ends up being the, the mainstream voice that gives this, this quote, and I quote, and this is what he says that derails this whole thing. He, oh. said, he says, it would be cool if they were right about this being an ancient structure. But it would, all, it would be too advanced for anything we have seen in the new world for that time. The structures are out of time and out of place. So he didn't come along and say, aha, look, we, we checked this out. Sorry, guys, it's just a coincidence. It's, it's just a natural formation. He didn't, they didn't say that at all. They said, based on what we're taught in our school book, history books and based on this, this narrative that we're given, these structures would be impossible based on that timeline. And that was it. They, that was the statement that was given by them for this. Now, what's really amazing about it is if you go into the local cultures along the Yucatan, where I told you those mining sites were, this, the area of the Maya, the ancient Maya had these stories. Some of the cultures there had stories about how they said that their ancestors used to live on an island east of there that vanished beneath the sea. Their ancestors that vanished beneath the sea, okay? Now, what's the problem with this that they come out with as being, they say, is evidence for this not being possible is that when ocean levels in this area were above sea level was around 50,000 years ago. So they said it, they say it's impossible that this could have been built by ancient cultures because ocean levels would have been, had to have been 50,000 years ago to be above ground, which means that this structure could, it could be 50,000 years old. Now, However, what? I, I know, and I want to give a caveat to that. Now, the only description we have of Atlantis that give us any idea of where it was, was that Plato states in the Timaeus and Critias that there was an ancient island landmass called Atlantis somewhere west of the Pillars of Hercules, which are the Straits of Gibraltar in Spain and Morocco. This is still west of that area. And we've been so focused on places like the Canary Islands in Western Africa that so I, it's, it's entirely possible that this area could have been Atlantis. Now, remember what I said in, off of Nassau, Bahamas, the Bimini Road and that ancient structures we saw under, under the underwater. And then this area right next to it, as well as all the Aztec and Maya and everything else. It's like these ancient cultures and the sophistication just surrounds the Caribbean. So basically, they discredit this as being possible. Um, but what Plato says, it's so interesting to me because it, it seems to match what the Maya said as their ancestors vanished beneath the sea on an ocean, uh, an island, was that Plato says that Atlantis 
vanished beneath, beneath the ocean in a violent set of uh, catastrophes, cataclysms. Remember when I was just showing you that sea mounts where you had those canyons right off of the continental shelf and all these disasters that have gone on to wipe out these cultures? It's entirely possible that those events were what wiped out these cultures too. Now, the, but some are going to say, they're going to call out on me and say, but Matt, Plato doesn't say that, that Atlantis was destroyed 50,000 years ago. No, he doesn't. The date he gives is somewhere around 11 or 12,000 years ago for Atlantis being destroyed. But I want to point out that this area, if you look geologically when they were doing research, it's located right on top of a major fault line, major fault line. And it's entirely possible that if those events at the Younger Dryas were so violent, we're not just talking about outfalls, outflows from the, the, the ice caps melting, but what about volcanoes all over the earth going off and massive earthquakes so big that some of the tectonic plates were literally shifting because the balance of the North and South Pole was wobbling around. The electromagnetic fear of our planet was being disrupted. The energetic North and South Pole magnetism that creates this balance that we have can get disrupted during changes from a grand solar minimum to a grand solar maximum or vice versa. And that seems to be why we see this rise and fall of civilizations where these disasters seem to happen on the planet. Now, what happened? To answer Johnny's question, at the time of the discovery, there was a lot of excitement and National Geographic came out and made a statement about how they wanted to go down and investigate these sites, as well as a number of other scientists and government organizations. 19 years has passed since then, almost 20 years, just disappeared. No, it's like, I think the mentality with our, you know, our collective consciousness is, you know, if you give it enough time because of all the things that go on in our lives and all the things we're distracted about, people are just going to forget and ignore it. That's exactly what happened. They never came out with saying a statement that this wasn't real and debunking it or anything. They just decided to just ignore it and bury it. And then all these individuals, organizations like National Geographic, they probably got told to stop what you're what you're looking at and you know cease and assist yeah that's and, exactly what happened yeah and so this was buried and to this day and this is where sam might get fired up is you know i am as a collective consciousness we as a people should you know push back and 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 force something like this to be investigated because this is sitting down there on the ocean floor and if this was investigated it's got so much evidence behind it so many experts have looked at it. So many sonar images are, are proving that these structures are there. And it's, in, it's impossible to explain that if that site was investigated, it would completely re redesign the entire narrative of human history and change our entire perspective of how all of this is looked at in, in our history. And now this is the last slide we're going to wrap up here. But what I want to point out and show on here that is so interesting is that Sam and I have talked about this in the previous shows, but if you map out where most of the ancient megalithic advanced building sites are all around the world, whether it's Stonehenge to down off of Easter Island and um, in, in Peru, right over um, into minor ley lines and major line, ley line locations, you find that these structures were built in very precise and important locations. It wasn't just that they built in fertile places. In fact, the complete opposite is true. Down in Bolivia and Peru, places like Tiwanaku and Pumupuku are built along the, the, the shores of Lake Titicaca. It's like a high desert up there. There's hardly any water. It's really, really difficult to live. And yet they built all these sophisticated structures. Why? Because our earth has a delicate balance of this electromagnetic grid. And it has these, these points where energy meets in these locations called ley lines. And there are what are known as major ley lines and minor ley lines. And when you map out those ley lines all around the world, you find that these structures are all built on those ley lines. So these ancient cultures, let's say this area of Atlantis, this, this civilization of Atlantis, this grand civilization, they get wiped out, sunk under the ocean, and they have all these violent earth changes that are going on it would have been in their best interest to go around everywhere in the world to where these energetic ley lines are and create these energetic structures, AKA pyramids as a way to focus that energy to balance it. 
And I think that was one of the major reasons why they built these structures in the places that they did. They said, hey, look, this whole, this, these are disasters, they just wiped out our whole civilization. If we want any means of continuing this, not only do we need to pass this knowledge and, and create these, these other civilizations off of it, but we need to create structures to help balance it so that this doesn't happen again. Unfortunately, it did. And it wiped out even those cultures too. And that's why we, we seem so primitive now compared to where we used to be. Because despite their attempts to try to balance all of these changes, it looks like it was not successful and they were wiped out anyway. And now we had this major reset and we're just trying to come back and find everything that was lost. Now, why am I bringing that up? Well, look at the map I have. Look where I've keyed in on. What's right off the Bahamas? One of the most important ley lines of the entire planet. One of the most energetic locations, the Bermuda Triangle area where everyone disappears in planes and never is heard of again. Right off, this is right off the Bahamas where they would go to these sites to create structures to try to balance it. But if things went the other way, those would be the hardest hit areas on the whole planet. It's like that's where the energy would disrupt the planet the most. And that's why they built them there as a way to try to balance it, I think. So therefore, the question that people would come up with, they say, hey, Matt, but these ley lines aren't right on those structures anymore. It's actually proof in that explanation to show that these major earth changes happen. Because what, what happened with these earth changes was it just it moved the plate tectonics around in such a violent way because of earthquakes that it was like a jigs jigsaw puzzle rearranging it. And so now the ley lines that used to be in slightly different locations are now different than they were before, showing that the whole entire North Pole location shifted and just moved everything around, but they're still close enough that we can, we can be able to say, oh, look at the correlation in those. But look at how far that shifted. If we can hy hypothesize to say, well, maybe that ley line that's off the Bahamas, maybe it was like right over Cuba or right between the Bahamas and Cuba. And that's why we see building on either side of those areas. And to connect this whole thing, Sam, in the Aztec empire, there's a place called Tula, which I've brought up before, Tula, Mexico. And there's these giant statues in Tula, Mexico that they're holding handbags, just like we see exactly in places like Mesopotamia, showing that the knowledge was shared. But what's more important of that than that is that those statues are known as the Atlantean warriors. They're called the Atlantean warriors in Mexico, right next to this, these structures. And what I think happened was that those ancestors and those in individuals of Atlantis once had a grand civilization here and they went out and they built subsequent civilizations all around them. Now, if you look in, in Mexico, you'll see three minor ley lines from Central America right up through Mexico down there. And that's the same location where all of these ancient Aztec and Mayan sites are built today. So it's, they were obsessed with energy and balancing all of the, these different aspects. And they understood that minor and, layer, and minor and major ley lines was the way to essentially achieve those types of balances to continue on their civilization to the next era. And that's where we're essentially at wow. now is that we have a situation now where there may be hundreds of underwater structures and civilizations all around the planet underwater. And we just, choose to ignore them and go about our daily life and pretend crazy. like none of this exists out there. We've explored quote unquote space more than <laughs> we've explored our own oceans. Isn't that amazing? Now, now why would they do that unless they didn't want to, to show what was down there? Yeah, That's for sure. Cause it blows the timelines all up. And I'm telling you, man, it's this small group of very powerful people over the last thousand to 2000 years that have been amassing wealth and power that are co totally trying to change the way our, where we live and our history. And this is just more proof of that. And that, I mean, like, like I said, Matt, you, you know, you blow my mind to that, that, that picture of that underground thing. Who, that could be Atlantis, or that could be one of many Atlantises. Who knows if, honestly, dude, Atlantis was one place. It could I, don't be think, I don't think it was, Sam. I think Atlantis was part of a global civilization. Yes. That, that had yes, that's what I'm thinking, dude. So this, structure, this set of structures here, I would say 
if we were to correlate evidence, there's a high probability that it's part of Atlantis, at least yeah. part of Atlantis. And of course, you could see why they wouldn't want something like that found, right? Because that would just blow this entire paradigm and change, and change everything. It would change everything. So what do I think happened here? It's possible that, I just want to conclude by saying, it's possible that these structures are 50,000 years old. In fact, the timeline, I just created a 200,000 year timeline on my website, thestageoftime.com, where I try to place where all of these events were. And I do think it's possible Atlantis could have been as old as 50,000 years. But the one caveat to this, and I mentioned that Plato says that this Atlantis wasn't 50,000 years old, is that tectonic activity can cause plates to submerge, submerge themselves deep underwater, which means that this disaster, these structures may have been submerged only 11 or 12,000 years ago during these events and then thrown deep underwater so that it, it confuses geologists to say, to, to not incorporate those massive catastrophes into their processing for understanding. Wow. Okay. Wow. Wow. We've been around for a very long time and yeah. that we're very, much more special than what we're being told and the manipulation of that information by what I believe is a very small group of people to kind of not let us know how special we all are. Yeah. That to me is the most amazing thing. Yeah. And, it, and basically it would change, it would, it would open up questions also about saying, well, if there are ancient texts like cuneiform writings from Mesopotamia and ancient Hindu writings, like I mentioned, the Bhagavad Gita and, and, and many other Vedic texts and other things out there, it would make us say, okay, so those are older than what we're told in the Bible, which you know, we're, a lot of people think is, is the, the origins of all of these stories. But there, once we learn that all of these, these religious stories are based on much older stories, it would make people have to pay attention to what those ancient writings say and, and you know, as, I, as well as I do, they say so many incredible things about human history and who we really are and where we came from, mentioning gods and deities and beings like the Anunnaki that were like controlling and creating civilizations. It would change everything. And I think that's why ultimately all of this stuff is hushed up. It's not really that they're worried about rewriting history books because it's a pain in the ass. It's because yeah. it would change the entire paradigm and system that has gone on here for so long since the Roman Empire. This, cog this cognitive en engine of normalcy and conformity would just collapse and it would, everything would change. And I just want to mention one more thing, guys. In this image, before I let you guys go, in that image, notice at the front of the temple where, we met, where XG was talking about some of the areas that they're walled in areas. Notice how it, it's strewn and destroyed all over the place. You see that? That tells you that this site had a major cataclysm hit it and, just, and destroyed certain parts of the site. So that's why every one of these sites we seem to come across, there's evidence of major destruction that occurred to them, which gives us the way to end out by saying, well, we know that these structures are much older than we're told, and we know they were destroyed by violent cataclysms. So therefore, all that's left is for us to objectively investigate them and then just create from scratch, just throw the entire old book out, book of our story, and rewrite the entire thing over again. Matt, that should be your job. That I'm, should I'm, be. I'm trying right now. That. That's what I'm working on. But one, like the, uh, you know, the true story of human history, dude, and just bang it out going, this is probably what happened. Matt LaCroix comes in solidifying his place on top of Mount Rushmore of uh, tinfoil hat. I want to thank you, Matt, for spending your time with us, taking, uh, bringing us through this very, very well-researched presentation. Thank you. I want to thank Johnny and XG for uh, joining me and helping me. I know this was supposed to be their day off, and I do this to them all the time, but and that's why I, I enjoy working with them. So thank you both. I want to thank everybody sure. listening uh, to the show. I hope you appreciate uh both Matt XG and Johnny uh, doing this today because they didn't have to and, you know, spending time with us. So thank you guys all. Appreciate you. I hope you guys enjoy this and take this and do your own research and try to discover what's out there.